We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as we uh, continue on uh, and uh, just wanted to tell a little, a little cute story this week in regards to uh, uh, Billy Graham that um, I wanted to share that at least slightly ties in with uh, our message this, uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, apparently and it happened a number of years ago, Billy Graham was at 87 uh, at the time. He was still speaking uh, various places around the country. Uh, and he had just flown back into Charlotte from, uh, from one of those speaking engagements. Uh, and usually, some, you know, somebody of his staff would pick him up or whatever, and I guess folks were busy, so they, they hired somebody, and they didn't realize that when the guy went to pick him up, uh, he would pick him up in, in a limousine, which is pretty, pretty unusual for Billy Graham. He's probably used to Franklin coming to get him in his pickup truck. Uh, and so uh, he's, uh, he's kind of amazed at this big limousine. Uh, and he tells the guy, he says, um, you know, I've never ridden in one of these things before. Uh, is, would you let me drive it? I, I, you know, I just kind of, <laughs> that'd be kind of a kick. And they go, hey, Mr. Graham, whatever you want to do, certainly. So, he, so Billy Graham jumps in, the guy <laughs> gets in the back seat, uh, and, uh, and they're driving along. And apparently uh, he gets going a little too fast down the freeway uh, and gets pulled over. And the, uh, the uh, state patrolman comes, comes <laughs> up to the front, the window, you know, goes down, and here's Billy Graham sitting there in the driver's seat, and, and he, you know, he obviously recognizes, oh, oh Mr. Graham, you're, you're going a little fast here. You, you want to wait here just a moment, Mr. Graham? And he goes back, and he gets on the radio, and he says, uh, calls uh, his commanding officer, he says, you know, I just p- pulled somebody over here on the interstate, somebody very important, and I know the law is the law, but, you know, I just... I'm just wondering if I should make, make an exception here. And the guy says, well, how important is this person? Well, he's more important than the governor. And he says, wow, it's not the president, is it? He goes, no, he's, he's, more, he's a lot more important than the president. <laughs> and uh, well, he said, well, well, who is it? He goes, well, I don't know if you're going to believe this, and I didn't really see him, but I'm pretty sure it's Jesus Christ because <laughs> Billy Graham is the chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy had a little confusion of the idea of being a servant of God and, uh, and being, a, being a leader. I don't, I don't blame his perspective there, but the people in Corinth uh, were caught up into personalities and somebody being better uh, than someone else as well. I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, uh, I'm of Jesus Christ, and so forth. Uh, and it caused great division in the church. Remember, our theme here for the whole book is... Um, is uh, Paul is spanking the saints, and there's a series of things that he is dealing with, and the first one, which is very extensive and will continue on uh, almost to chapter 4, is this idea of division uh, in in the church, and it's all come because uh, basically uh, they're not seeing things with God's wisdom, but are rather chosen to see uh, the ministry and their place uh, in the church through uh, the wisdom of the world. Uh, and uh, a previous message, we talked about the fact that at a point in time in our own culture, uh, we've allowed the philosophies of the world to become the judge of the Bible in our faith, rather than the Bible being the judge uh, of the philosophies uh, of this world. So uh, there's many things uh, that we can relate to in terms of the church uh, here, uh, here in Corinth. Uh, and now he deals with this issue, the root issue. Uh, we've talked about pride. We've talked about him pointing them back to the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, he mentions their own testimonies of, of uh, who they were before, who they'd become uh, in Jesus Christ, uh, uh, appealing to a humility that might be there to uh, end the division. And now he begins to uh, use this term uh, carnal, and, uh, and we'll talk more about what that means. It's used a lot, a lot of different ways. Uh, NIV uses the word worldly. How does a person become carnal or worldly? Uh, Because we'll also see they weren't this way. Now, when a person first comes to uh, faith in Christ, uh, they've just experienced salvation. They're referred to as a a babe in Christ, like a newborn babe. And they they need to learn and they grow and so forth. And there's uh, that's fine, and there, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not what he's dealing with. He's going to use that term to these, uh, these believers uh, who have had tremendous teaching. Paul taught them for a year and a half. Uh, had a, Apollos, one of the great speakers uh, of the New Testament church in the first century. And apparently some of them have been taught by Peter uh, as well. Uh, and, w- and when they say, and some are above Jesus Christ, 
that could even imply that some of them actually heard Jesus Christ teach uh, in, uh, before his death and resurrection. So they, they've <laughs> that'd be a pretty good Bible conference. I think we get a few people to turn out uh, for that. Uh, the teaching and the leadership uh, and their example before them went, was not the problem. Uh, and they started out well, but something happened. And we'll see that. It's, it's, it, it's not even just the idea that they didn't grow in their faith. Something happened uh, and their growth in Christ has stopped. Uh, and it's because uh, in their mind, they begin to once again be absorbed into the world and the world's philosophy and a world system. They become uh, carnal, uh, and that's, that's the idea. And Paul's, uh, of course, very concerned about it. That's what's causing uh, the division here. He'll talk about, again, this idea of carnality. That word uh, uh, in the New Testament is translated several different ways. Sometimes it's uh, in an English translation, it's, it's simply said the flesh. And it's not just, that word can mean your physical body, but often it's not. It's talking about the sin nature that we, with, that we have. Uh, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're given a new nature, uh, but we're still uh, struggling uh, with it. I, I sure a number of years ago, I uh, started reading a book by a very well-known uh, Christian author, best-selling author. I'd heard him speak in person. I like to hear him when he's on the radio occasionally, and um, very dynamic guy. So I was interested in what he had to say on this subject of uh, of uh, uh, of this change, the new nature versus the old nature, and so forth. Uh, and as he, I got into it by about the third chapter, then he's quoting Paul from Romans and the idea of Paul there saying you need to reckon or count on the old man or that flesh or this old sin nature being dead so that you are now alive uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, and he went on to basically say that uh, once you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you no longer have an old nature. Uh, you just need to, to realize that you no longer have it anymore. I, I threw the book away <laughs> because uh, I'm pretty sure I've still got one. And, uh, uh, and I would agree with the Apostle Paul uh, in his own struggles. This is what Paul says in Romans 7. Uh, I'm sure you can relate to it. And this is from the New Living, just to make it a little more uh, obvious. Paul there says uh, of this battle within himself... Uh, I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, am I not really the one doing wrong? Uh, it is sin living in me that does it, the sin nature. I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law, the Bible, with all my heart. But there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ. And then Paul will, will go on and talk more about that in Romans. And of course, gets us to the, uh, what is for many people their favorite chapter in the Bible, Romans, Romans 8 where he starts out just to remind us there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And a life in Christ is, is, the, uh, is the answer in God's power working within us. Uh, there is a sin nature. We all have it. Uh, the Corinthian believers were doing well, apparently, at one time, uh, but now they've become dominated. They, they've slipped back into this idea of being worldly or being carnal, uh, as, uh, as believers. So let's take a look at it. We're only going to go through the first nine verses, but verses one to three, we'll see the basic problem is carnality. What's causing division within the church? Paul says, and I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, there's our word, as to babes in Christ, his other definition. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it and even now, you are still not able. You are still carnal. That's, that's the problem. Notice first in verse 1, he begins, uh, very importantly, and I, brethren. So uh, again, he's, his recognition of his love for them, his relationship with them, and their relationship to the Lord. He's not saying you guys need to get saved. He's saying you are saved. Uh, believers in Jesus Christ 
can start out and never and never really grow and kind of remain babes in Christ. And it, and it, it doesn't even matter uh, how great the teaching is, apparently, that they're, they're receiving. Uh, believers can start out, apparently, and at some point in time fall back into this uh, state of being a babe in Christ or just simply being carnal. But he, before he even gets into the, uh, the exhortation, he reminds them they're brothers uh, in the Lord. And first, uh, again, we'll see their carnality has kept them from uh, spiritual maturity. They're still immature, and the, the carnality uh, is affected them in three ways. And I, brother, could not speak to you uh, as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, <clears throat> and it's a Greek word, uh, uh, sarkinos, or fleshly ones, again, described different ways in different texts. Uh, the humanness of the man's fallen nature is uh, is the idea. He's already talking about the people that are saved, the people that are not saved, uh, and now this other definition. The word babes means uh, uh, an infant, and of course it's okay to be uh, uh, an infant, but uh, it's not okay to remain, remain that way. <coughs> we sometimes, um, people that uh, are observers of our culture, talk about the problem, one of the problems we have with uh, young men uh, in this country, and uh, sometimes they use a description, a failure to launch. <laughs> that means they've never, they've never got going in life. You know, they're uh, 18, and they're still wearing those jammies with the footies in the bottom, you know. <laughs> you know, their bed is a little race car, you know, they've had since they're 12. I, uh, <clears throat> my, uh, my office down the hallway just happens to be at the back of the uh, Korean restaurant, and um, uh, over the years of being there, I, I uh, occasionally get to know all of the dishwashers that seem to go, come and go every, every six months. Uh, the guy that's there right now is uh, not one of my favorites uh, because he uh, has a habit, apparently. He, he loves the idea that the hallway has a, a huge echo in it. And, uh, and so he, he likes to try out and see how, large, how loud he can burp uh, in, in the hallway. He's quite, quite good at it. And uh, I've thought before that I should go and kind of introduce myself and then let them know, let them know that, you know, I was talking to some of the 12-year-olds over here at Akahi, you know, the sixth graders, and they're having a burping contest, and, you know, because 12-year-olds are into that, they're into bodily noises and function, it takes up a lot of their conversation, uh, and perhaps he could join them. Now, I don't know if there's an age limit, I mean, you're like 20 so I don't know if the 12-year-old kids will let you into their cunt, but just to point out that, hey, uh, shouldn't we kind of be on this uh, by, by now? Uh, and that's the idea here. Uh, there hasn't been any, uh, any real growth. Uh, carnality, uh, this worldliness, it really it's a mindset, has kept them from maturing in the Lord. Secondly, the carnality uh, prevented them from receiving the word. Uh, again, what, what are the marks of maturity? For one thing, it's, it's your diet. He mentions that in verse 2. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. Even now, you are still not able. And of course, when kids are little, they <clears throat> start out uh, pretty basic. We've got the grandkids around the dinner table every night. So we have the uh, gamut of uh, Josiah that's uh, just starting to eat a little solid food and, you know, all the way up to Vanessa uh, at, uh, at eight. But, uh, you know, they progress. They learn to eat uh, different things as they, as they go along. It starts out pretty, pretty basic. Uh, the Bible, God's word, is referred to uh, as milk in First Peter, as bread in Matthew 4, as meat in Hebrews 5, as honey in Psalm 119. Um, we could say you are what you eat, and, uh, and that would be true spiritually uh, as well. Diet is important. Uh, the immature believer, the carnal believer, the worldly believer uh, is not able to handle meat, the idea. They still have to be taught and dealt with uh, as though they're a brand new Christian. We would say that the new believer <clears throat> lives on Bible stories and not Bible doctrine. Uh, too much Bible doctrine, and they get spiritual indigestion, <laughs> and they would, uh, they would rather have something of a, uh, of a lighter, lighter fare. Uh, and it's good. I mean, initially, it's important to, to learn those Bible stories and, uh, and those things uh, uh, about God's Word. I was just thinking, as we were singing that, uh, that one song, uh, in that vision 
that vision of heaven, and we mentioned the seraphim uh, around the throne of God. For a lot of people, they might hear that song, sing along with it, and wonder what a seraphim is. Uh, knows that it's something to do with heaven or God's throne. But for a lot of people, they know exactly what that is, that it's angel uh, and it's plural. Uh, and they would maybe like I did begin to envision and think about Isaiah in the year that King uh, Uzziah died. I was high and lifted up, Isaiah. And he paints a picture of, of, of heaven and being there in the throne of God. And then your mind might drift to uh, Ezekiel and his visions of, of God's throne and so forth. And then your mind might even then go to Revelation and some of the... But not if you're, not if you're worldly, not if you're carnal, because your, your mind has never gone to those things yet. You've never, you've never absorbed them. Uh, that's, that's the idea. It's okay when you're a new believer, <laughs> but you should be maturing is the, is the idea. I, uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you a little story on Auntie, Auntie Doreen. So Kathy's sister, when she, we were, of course, thrilled when she uh, came to faith in Christ, and we'd been praying for her for years. And uh, when Kathy first got saved, she was really the only one, first one in her immediate family. And uh, over the years, everybody's come to the Lord, brothers and sisters, and so many others. But when uh, Auntie Doreen uh, first got saved, uh, she, <laughs> she was a blank slate. She knew nothing. So uh, we told her to come on over. Our kids were little. Come over to our house and watch Superbook <laughs> with the kids. Superbook's an animated Bible story series, which she did <laughs> diligently so she could learn all of her Bible stories so there'd be some context then for the doctrines that she was learning on Sunday morning. <laughs> but the carnal, the carnal believer uh, is prevented from, uh, from learning these things because of a mindset. It's not important. They're so been absorbed uh, by the world's philosophies. So thirdly, uh, carnality was pr prevents future growth. And I'll, I'll give you three reasons for this and what it does and, uh, and three cross-references. But notice the second half of verse 2, and even now you're still not able. You're not able. Uh, Paul's like, if, if I were there trying to teach you, I wouldn't be able if I were there, I would want to explain maybe what he explained to the Romans in terms of uh, justification by faith and why that's so important, the process of sanctification. He says, I wouldn't be able to. You wouldn't get it. There's something that's happened there. Uh, there's three reasons why. If you fall into carnality, if you're in it now, uh, there is no hope for future growth in you in terms of the Word of God, unless something changes. Uh, and the first reason is carnality prevents future growth because children or infants have no discernment. They have no discernment, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in the real world here, much less is this metaphor. And for this, I want to look at Ephesians over in chapter 4, and I have these verses for you. In verses 13 and 14, Paul expresses the same concern Notice, till we all come to the unity of the faith. That's our subject. Uh, there's divisions. Uh, it's caused by carnality. That's the same subject matter. Until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. That means a mature person. To the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children. Now, that's our same word, babes or, or infants. It's the same word in the Greek. No longer children. Because what happens to children? They're tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. <clears throat> Carnal Christians don't mature because they're not able to receive the word. Why? They're easily deceived. Pretty easy to deceive a three-year-old, isn't it? Uh, you know, I, I can do great magic tricks, you know, with a three-year-old. I just, I'm not too good with an adult or a teenager. Uh, uh, they're easy to, easily deceived. Groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons look for the worldly, the carnal believer. That's their main target. They aren't doing inner city ministries. They're not down there feeding the poor. Uh, they're not outreaching to people uh, that uh, are their 
uh, intellectual abilities that they have. That's, they, they look for this kind of person because they know they're easily deceived. Uh, when they knock on those doors and they find out you used to go to church, all right, the light bulb goes off. Uh, this one's ours. This is somebody that knows something about Christ, may have even been a Christian at one point in time, but they're worldly, they're carnal, their growth has been uh, stunted, and they're, they're able, they're able to deceive them uh, so, so easily. Uh, and, yeah, because kids, kids just have trouble discernment. They have trouble making up their minds. That's why they, that's why they invented Happy Meals. It was too confusing. We're at McDonald's. What would you like? Oh, my God, they're 16. I don't know. Maybe, you know, no, it's, it's a lot easier, right, with your five-year-old go, what would you like, number one or two? You know, there's two Happy Meals. Want the cheeseburger or do you want the whatever? You know, it's like uh, McDonald's has made it easy. They're smart. They understand children don't have great discernment. They're, they're confused uh, over everything. Uh, and it's the same thing for the, uh, the babe in Christ. They're unstable doctrinally. They're looking for the latest fad in Christianity. They're easily influenced by false teachers. Uh, they're looking for the extra buck, the latest brand of theology. Uh, and you see them move and row from place to place and teacher to teacher as a result. Secondly, carnality is preventing future growth because children or infants are slow in learning or dull in hearing, as the writer of Hebrews tells us uh, in chapter 5, verse 12. And his phrase here is uh, dull of hearing. There he writes, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Our same, same words. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So there it is again. Uh, when you grow in the Lord and you're not, and you grow in the, the knowledge of God's word, you, you learn discernment, good and evil. Uh, you're by, it's by use. It's, it's not you're just hearing it. Uh, you, the Pharisees knew God's word. They had most of it memorized. Uh, but they still didn't know who Jesus Christ was. Uh, they're actually putting it uh, in, into practice. Now notice the, um, the preceding verse is where the phrase dull of hearing comes into uh, here in uh, Hebrews 5. Again, same context, same writer, uh, talking about Jesus Christ being our great high priest. <clears throat> of him, he says, was called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say, and hard to explain, since you've become dull of hearing. You've never matured. Uh, you're still worldly. I, like to, I would like to talk to you about this very interesting fellow, Melchizedek. But I can't even go there. He's an interesting fellow, though, isn't he? Uh, why Jesus Christ needs to be like him in terms to be our great high priest. This guy that appears out of nowhere. Uh, that has no father, no mother, no genealogy. Uh, he's a prince of Salem. He shows up uh, and appears on the scene after Abraham comes back with his 318 guys uh, going after the, uh, his folks that were captured by the five kings. Uh, he, he chases them all the way to the southern border of Lebanon and rescues them. They come back. They're outside Sodom. This guy shows up. Uh, Abraham says he's greater because he pays him a tie. This guy busts out. He brings out uh, uh, wine and bread. Is this communion? What's going on? Who is Melchizedek anyway? I'm sorry, I can't get into it with you. <laughs> Paul says, it's just, you just never even progressed. You can't figure out good and evil, uh, right, right from, from wrong. It's a problem. And the idea here is that uh, something's happened. Something's happened in their walk with the Lord that has caused this. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and it's a problem. Uh, we come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're growing in the Lord, and then we kind of hit a plateau, and uh, and we uh, we just kind of end right right there. I heard there's a football game today, <laughs> and if one team, we hope this doesn't happen, but if one team gets way ahead, one team gets way ahead, 
<laughs> then what they'll do in the second half, especially that last quarter, is they'll, the phrase is, they'll run out the clock. They, don't, they won't really care about putting any more points in the board. Uh, they'll just run running plays that consume a lot of time on the clock. They'll just try to keep the ball away from the other team. Uh, they're not advancing a strategy. They're not advancing a game plan. They're not trying to get down the full field. They're not trying to score again. They're just running out the clock. And that's what happens to believers. You know, they're, they, they're going along and they're growing in the Lord, and that's awesome, and they're excited, and then something happens, and they're just running out the clock, uh, and they're not growing uh, in any longer. Uh, and, and then it becomes a problem because in that state of mind, they're unable to grow, they're unable to really discern. Uh, they're easy targets for false uh, teachers. Uh, they just can't absorb or digest important things in regards to uh, the Word of God. Thirdly, carnality is still preventing future growth uh, because they're forgetful hearers. And here we look at a passage from our, our James study that we did not that long ago, but uh, one of the classic lines from uh, James chapter 1, verse 24. James says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. They, they hear it, and you know the comparison. James says you're like a person that you look in a mirror, and you walk away, and you forget you forget what you've even seen. Now, I have to admit, as you get a lo little older, that's kind of a blessing. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's not good spiritually uh, to look into the mirror of God's Word uh, and, uh, and forget what you've seen. Warren Wordsby says, many people have the mistaken idea that hearing a good sermon or a Bible study is what makes them grow and gets God's blessing. It is not the hearing, but the doing that brings the blessing. There are many Christians... Too many Christians mark their Bibles, but their Bibles never mark them. Uh, it's not enough. Th these guys had awesome teachers, right? They, they had Paul. They had Peter. They had Apollos. Uh, they had probably some of the uh, greatest Bible teachers in the history of the church, but it didn't help them grow. Uh, when I was a younger believer, <clears throat> every time I met somebody that, uh, that was from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, I, I would be under this assumption that they'd be like super Christians because, man, they sit right there under Pastor Chuck every week. I mean, I listened to his tapes until I, uh, till I worn them out and uh, the radio and, uh, and everything. And, and, uh, uh, and so, I, you know, I, of course, when we're, we're there for the conferences, get to hear him in person, when Chuck would come over here, we'd never miss a time that he would. So, man, every week and twice a week to hear Chuck, man, you know, but you know what, what I found? There's a lot of really immature Christians at Calvary Chapel goes to Mesa. It's, it's not enough to have good teaching. Uh, it's whether you're doing it or not. Uh, again, so we may go and look into a mirror and still be deceived because we're not doers. Uh, to be a doer is a command uh, in this context. Uh, it requires a, a change. The word be can be translated become. Uh, there's hope in this because you can become. You can change. You can become a, a doer of the word is the idea. The warning, don't be a hearer only. Uh, a hearer uh, means, uh, uh, that word means to audit, like in auditing a class. You, know, you can take a class for credit or you can audit a class. If you audit the class, it's a lot cheaper uh, but, uh, and you don't have to take any tests. You don't have to write any papers and you don't have to worry about a grade. You're not going to get much out of it too. I've I've taught Bible college, and I can tell you, the people that are auditing, they just, they don't have anything, uh, there's no skin in the game. So they, they enjoy the lectures, uh, but it's not quite the same thing. Uh, this is the idea. Uh, don't audit Christianity is what he's saying here. And then don't be deceived. Uh, listening to the word only and never doing it uh, then brings deception, he says. And this is, a, uh, in the Greek, a mathematical term. Uh, and it means a miscalculation. Again, uh, is it possible uh, for me to be deceived? Uh, how does that happen? Uh, I can equate Bible knowledge with practical experience, uh, and it's not the same thing. Uh, the Pharisees miscalculated when it came to the Word of God. Uh, again, they, they had most of it memorized. 
Listen to what Jesus says in John 5, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. These guys heard it. They knew it. They were never doers. They deceived themselves. Later, Jesus would ask the question in Luke 6, uh, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? Uh, the carnal Christian, the worldly, the fleshly, whatever English word we want to uh, use for this Greek term, uh, is like a babe in Christ. It's somebody that's not maturing. They've either never matured or, in this case, they've matured and kind of hit a plateau. They're just running out the clock. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're no longer interested in the things of God, and it cripples them uh, in terms of their growth. Uh, it cripples them in terms of getting anything out of, uh, out of God's Word. Have you ever heard anyone say that? Well, I, you know, I try to have devotions. I just don't get anything out of it. Uh, that, that should be uh, like a little alarm clock uh, go, go, going off uh, in, your, in your heart and mind if, you, if you've said that or heard someone say that. The real problem in terms of division in the church, which, uh, of course, is, is rampant today. It's not something that ended in the first century. Uh, the problem is cardinality. Uh, it admit, secondly, that they were controlled by their sinful nature. That's point two. Again, the sinful nature is what that word means in terms of carnality. They're controlled by it. And that's the, the second half of verse 3 on into verse 4. But where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For one says, I'm of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? So here are the, the practical warning. Paul says it, it controls this person in four different ways. He spells it out here. And again, this is one of those, if you have a, uh, a translation other than a, a King James or New King James, it's going to condense it into a couple of words. But in a Greek text, there's actually four words here. Uh, the first one is uh, they're controlled in their sinful nature. It's indicated by envy. Verse 3, for, for where, where there is our envy... Uh, envy is a word where we get our word zealous, uh, but it has to do with coveting. It has to do with coveting. Uh, you want what others have. You believe the advertising <laughs> that tells you you have to have all, all, these, uh, all these different, uh, uh, different things. Uh, James says that when you buy into that thinking, uh, you're buying into, again, the bigger subject here, the wisdom of the world. Uh, he uses the phrase in James 3.14, uh, but if you have, uh, it throws a little adjective here, bitter envy, but that's our word, envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, this kind of thinking, this philosophy does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic, demonic. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a lot of, there's a philosophy that's out there. There's a world system that's out there that's very different than a Christian worldview. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a frightening thing how many Christians don't, don't have the proper perspective. They believe and they trust the scriptures for their salvation. And they believe what it says, uh, but it has no application in their marriage, uh, in their job, uh, in their workplace, in their child training, in their finances, uh, and, and so forth. But the Bible speaks to all of these, uh, these areas. Secondly, being controlled by their sinful nature produced strife. Uh, again, uh, there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. Strife means confronting others without cause. Uh, you're confrontational. The mature uh, believers, <coughs> Paul tells us to, uh, to do everything we can to live at peace with all men. He tells us in, uh, in Romans. Uh, but the, the carnal believer is not, not that interested uh, in, uh, in that. Proverbs 17, 14 says, uh, uh, The beginning of strife is like releasing water, therefore stop contention before a quarrel starts. The releasing water is in like breaking a dam. You don't want to, you don't want to break the dam a little bit. You're going to have uh, uh, real problems on your hand. You're going to have quarrels. Uh, confronting others without cause. It's done all the time today on the Internet. People put things, messages, they put things up, they say things. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't believe it. I, uh, you know, I have my, uh, <clears throat> because of uh, Josh being in the military, I have to have a, a real restricted Facebook. It's, it's just immediate family. Uh, it's uh, uh, and everything. And the, uh, 
But, you know, we have the, the Calvary Windward one that I'll go on and check uh, a couple days a week, and there's, I don't know, 1,000, 1,100 people on that, so you get, you get, uh, a, lot of, you get, you get a lot of variety on there. And, uh, and it becomes very obvious that some of these people are Christians. Sometimes I recognize their names, and uh, I can't believe the stuff that they say uh, uh, on the Internet uh, and everything. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, confronting others without cause, strife. Uh, the carnal Christian causes strife. It's uh, symptomatic of where they're at. Uh, it's because they're controlled by their sin nature, not by the Spirit of God. Uh, three, being controlled by their sinful nature produce divisions. Uh, this means causing others to take sides. <clears throat> Paul says in Romans 16, 17, Now I urge you, brethren, <clears throat> note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. Paul says the, the people that are carnal out there that are actually doing and causing because they're controlled by their sinful nature, uh, they're causing division uh, within the body of Christ, within friendships, uh, within marriages, whatever it might be. Avoid them. Figure out who they are and avoid them. Uh, number four, being controlled by their sinful nature produce believers behaving as mere men. And that's kind of like... Uh, Okay, what does that mean? Are you not carnal and behaving like, like mere men? Well, Paul says uh, uh, he's, what he's talking about is you're, you're comparing yourselves uh, with other people uh, as opposed to comparing yourself with Jesus Christ. You know, if I, again, if I look into the mirror of God's word uh, and in it I see Jesus Christ and him compared to me, I'm not doing too well. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, God's word is constantly... Uh, you know, speaking to me, in a, in a, and it always has a lot to do with repenting, <laughs> and, uh, and that's what it should be doing. It should be changing me and, uh, and speaking to me. Uh, the problem is uh, I can be convicted by sin, uh, and then I can just compare myself with someone else who's much worse, and it's always easy to find somebody that's worse. Uh, of the false prophets <clears throat> and the false teachers that were coming into this church, Paul would say, in his second letter, the following, in uh, chapter 10, verse 12, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. Uh, don't compare yourselves to, to others. Allow God's word to do the comparison, to speak to you. Uh, again, we're we are incredible at uh, justifying our, ourselves, and it's, and it's part of the problem. And we live in a culture that glories in justification. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's just amazing some of the court cases we have now and the justifications why, why people are, you know, do, do certain things, like the, the tw famous uh, Twinkie defense, you know, I ate too many Twinkies, that's why I killed this person then. You've got the, the kid that ran off to, to Mexico because, uh, you know, he couldn't help himself. He was too affluent. You know, that was his, his problem there, you know. Uh, it, it's the justification. It starts with Adam, you know. Uh, uh, he sins. Well, uh, kind of in a way, Lord, I hate to point this out, it's actually your fault. It's the wife that you gave me. Uh, right from the beginning, the very first original sin there's an attempt to justify, rationalize our behavior. Uh, and we do that by comparing ourselves with others. So the problem is carnality. Carnality, it meant that they were controlled by their sinful nature. So Paul will now point out that neither he nor Apollos caused any spiritual growth among them. He's going to attempt to turn this around uh, and help them see the Lord in all this and what God has done uh, in their midst. Uh, the cause of growth is God himself, verses 5 to 9. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, the ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted Apollos' water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. The building we'll get to uh, in our next message. But uh, 
here. We'll look at the uh, illustration of the field. First, Paul says, Paul and Apollos each played a role in their salvation. Who then is Paul? Who is uh, Apollos? Ministers through whom uh, you believed. He's very clear that we weren't the cause, but we did play a, a, a role. Uh, they were simply, he said, servants, and that's our, our word doulos, uh, translated slave, uh, bond servant. Uh, uh, it uh, was often used in the Greek of a table waiter, what we might call a, a busboy. And Paul basically is saying that uh, uh, no one should build a monument uh, around a busboy, like you're trying to build uh, around us. Because that's what kids do, right? I mean, kids are into heroes. Kids are into super uh, heroes. There's a lot of adults that are in that as well. We're kind of a culture of, of heroes to, today. Uh, and unfortunately, you can, you can look at who our heroes are, and it says a lot about not the person, but about the culture itself. Uh, but look, kids are, kids are into, you know, Spider-Man, Superman, they're into heroes, superheroes, uh, if you haven't, don't know that, you haven't been around little kids <laughs> in a while, but they're, they're into it. Uh, and Paul is saying, this is ridiculous. Uh, you, you're wanting to extol us and make us some kind of heroes. All we were were doulos. We were just servants. We were just the busboys. We just showed up and gave you the gospel. Uh, in it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Uh, and, uh, and we were happy to be part of the process, uh, but we're not the ones that should be glorified. We were simply uh, instruments in the process, and we might uh, liken, it, uh, liken it this way. If you've, uh, if you've had a, a surgery, uh, and then the doctor comes to see you uh, after surgery, uh, and everything has gone well, and he's reporting and so forth, and your prognosis, and uh, you probably uh, shouldn't uh, or wouldn't say to him, well, doctor, thank you very much, but you know who I'd really like to see is the scalpel, you know, because... I, I just, you know, I just want to see the scalpel, you know, because I thank the Lord for that scalpel, you know, because, and I want to, I just, could I even have it to take it home? I have a little place, a little case I'm going, you, why would you not do that? Because it's simply the instrument. It was the doctor that did the surgery. That's Paul's point here. We were just the instruments. It was God that brought the increase. It was God that did the work in, uh, in your lives. The fact that you're dividing over us is because you're, you're carnal. And because you're carnal, you're now controlled by your sinful nature, no longer the nature, the new nature that God, uh, God gave you. Uh, in God's wisdom, we can look beyond ourselves. Uh, but in man's wisdom, we have a tendency to be very myoptic and look at ourselves. We can know God is our creator, sustainer, and savior uh, but uh, as uh, little children, immature, carnal, we have a tendency to be focused on ourselves. So Paul compares the ministry here to them uh, as to planting a garden. You are God's field. We could say you are God's cultivated field or God's, uh, God's garden. Paul only mentions two types of ministries here, uh, but they're certainly a, an important principle. He talks about the fact that, uh, that he planted in this illustration uh, but then Apollos watered. Uh, they both did two different things. And he says, in God's eyes, both of them are absolutely equal. Uh, no one should be exalted uh, one over the other. In other words, all of God's work uh, is important work. Uh, to glorify one type of Christian ministry or work above another is to be carnal. Uh, it's be divisive. To, uh, to extol, and we're, <laughs> Christianity really has become a, a, a much of a personality cult these, these days uh, because we will extol personalities, and we even, uh, we even have models uh, of ministry uh, for uh, church growth that are all devised around this idea of personality and, and the person that's uh, up front and so forth. And Paul says that it shouldn't be that way. All of God's ministers and ministries are equal uh, in, in God's sight. And uh, I think I got a little, little slideshow, or, or just one more slide, there it is. Uh, just to say that, you know, when, when uh, one of the fun things about being in Okinawa with the, <coughs> with the team is that, uh, uh, because I, I had to laugh, <coughs> because um, um, uh, one, of the, one of the moms 
uh, that's looking to go this time, because uh, parents will join us uh, uh, on the trip, said, uh, she said, <laughs> I was told, she said, uh, well, I, I'm just going as a chaperone. And of course, the other mom that had been laughed and <laughs> said, no, you're not, <laughs> because we all work. <laughs> we all work. Uh, and uh, a great example is that the, we did a luau at uh, Rick's Church, Calvary Chapel, Okinawa, in which uh, Dennis cooked in, uh, in two different kitchens <clears throat> with a couple of the other gals help, helping them all day, running from oven to oven, kitchen to kitchen, and the kitchen of the church to make uh, enough food for, I don't know how many, a couple hundred people, and uh, have it all done and hot at the same time. A lot of people involved in that. The kids were involved all day uh, getting uh, uh, this outdoor area set up and a stage and so forth. Uh, the, the girls danced. Uh, the guys were, were the band, uh, the, the boys in, uh, in the youth group, singing and leading worship. Uh, I'm the one that actually got up and shared the gospel, but even that wouldn't have gone very far if I didn't have a translator who had to translate everything. Uh, and it would be wrong, Paul says, to say that, that me preaching the gospel or the translator translating the gospel is any greater than Dennis cooking the food. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying all God's work is important. It doesn't matter what it is or what you're doing. We're all just called to different things. Now, he's going to get into spiritual gifts and, uh, and how they should be used and not abused and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but he says the trouble is carnal Christians can't see that. And they're extolling certain things above other things. And it's okay if you're a brand new believer and you're just trying to figure it all out. Well, just grow and figure it all out. It'll be, okay. It'll be all okay. And uh, uh, we see in the Bible, the, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. So just read and you'll, you'll be all right. You'll grow. And, uh, but for the person that uh, has been walking with the Lord for a while, uh, and is caught up into these things in this mindset, uh, it can be devastating because it, it arrests it arrest, uh, any possibility for growth. Uh, carnality is a, a general evil, one writer said, that creates many problems. It corrupts morals. It weakens personal relationships. It produces doubt about God's word and God. It destroys your prayer life, provides fertile ground for, for heresy. It's a concern. It should be a concern. I just want to close with, uh, uh, with an illustration because, again, the idea is something happened to these believers. Uh, I think it would have been pretty awesome to have Paul as your Bible teacher for a year and a half. I just think you probably would have got off on a pretty good start there. Uh, so what, what happened uh, to these believers? And uh, I think they probably uh, ignore some warning signs along the way. And to illustrate that, I had read in a book uh, this week called Death in the Grand Canyon, Over the Edge, by Michael uh, Gigli Giglieri, uh, and he chronicles the 700 people that have died in the Grand Canyon since the 1870s. And he talks about the you know, vast number, the biggest number have died from uh, uh, plane accidents, uh, airplanes that have gone down. Uh, there's another whole group that have died because of floods, uh, because of the... Uh, uh, Colorado River that cuts through the, the bottom and it seasonally it, it floods and people uh, don't estimate uh, uh, that, uh, that possibility. People die of uh, whitewater rafting uh, in, in the Grand Canyon. But what his book focused on is the number of people that died simply because of, of carelessness. And uh, uh, he says they, they've just, uh, they've gone over the edge, fallen to their death through their own carelessness uh, he says, specifically, they ignored posted warnings and confidently walked out onto dangerous precipices. And uh, just to give you a couple examples, in 1992, a 38-year-old father jokingly tried to frighten his teenage daughter by leaping onto a guard wall. Uh, he stood up, he pretended to lose his balance, and then like he's falling into the Grand Canyon, but there was dirt and everything below. So he falls off, jokingly, jumps and lands on the ground and loses his footing and slips and goes uh, right, right over the edge. In 2012, there was an 18-year-old woman who was hiking the North Rim, decided to ver venture off the path uh, to take a picture at a spot uh, known as uh, Inspiration Point. 
she sat down on the ledge, and the rocks gave way, and she fell 1,500 feet to her, uh, to her, to her death. Uh, it's just interesting. You know, people do things that are careless, and there's a huge price to be paid for it. As believers, we can be careless. We can ignore the signs. Uh, if, if I'm not getting anything out of my prayer time and my time with the Lord, uh, if I don't have the same desire uh, to be uh, in, in God's Word, if I'm not absorbing, if I find myself being more interested in the philosophies of the world and how they judge God's Word versus how God's Word judges uh, those things in the world, I need to recognize I'm becoming worldly. I'm becoming carnal. I'm going to slip into a place where I'll no longer be able to be fed on God's word. It's just too much for me. I would rather have something else. And I think I'm okay because I can compare myself with someone else who is far more worse than, than I am. So I really, I'm okay. And finally, I'm just a Christian who's running out the clock, you know, because they said the rapture is coming. So I'm just kind of do my thing, hang out until that time. And never do anything in terms of growth and advancing the kingdom of God or leading any other person to faith in Jesus Christ. So it's quite a warning. It's a terrible thing that's happened to this church. It's not unlike the church in America, in Hawaii today. The divisions that are, that are going on, it's symptomatic. It's just the first one. But it's because of there's the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. We can be absorbed by one or the other. A lot of it has to do with simple choice. Well, let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we thank you that you do have your word for us. We can uh, understand it. We saw in our study last time how you use your holy scriptures to minister to and through uh, the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives. Lord, and we pray that we would uh, not be like the church in Galatian, who Paul describes as foolish, it says, who's bewitched you? Because you, they, they've, they've turned to these kinds of things and become very carnal uh, instead of relying on God's Spirit to do a, just a beautiful work in their own hearts, transforming them into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we would read the Gospels and be marveled uh, at Jesus, His love, His kindness. Uh, read the Sermon on the Mount and just be amazed that... Uh, the things that he says there, and, uh, and see that that's who you want us to be uh, as, as your people. Lord, to have a, a love that uh, you pour into our hearts that just overflows to others and becomes a contagious thing. But Lord, it won't happen if we buy into a world system. The philosophies of this world, as they pertain to our spiritual life, Lord, so Lord, may we keep our eyes on you. Uh, in your word, growing in you. Help us see those, those uh, warning signs. Lord, help us to never reach the point where we feel like we're just running out the clock. Lord, if that's the case today in anyone's heart here, I pray they would repent and change their mind about that and about their relationship with you and have a desire to live today uh, in Jesus Christ. And not simply talk about how it used to be and back in the good old days. Because, uh, Lord, <laughs> that's not where you want us to live. We're thankful for your faithfulness in the past. Lord, we want to be excited about what you're doing today and in the future. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.